Hello, listeners, and welcome to the Down a Rabbit Hole podcast. I am your host, Cece Suarez. Today, we are diving into the religious cult of Jehovah's Witness. The opinions expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect those of the Down a Rabbit Hole podcast. Sensitive topics are discussed. Viewer discretion is advised. Picture this. It's the year 2020, and you're only two months into the pandemic. You take a little break from binge-watching YouTube videos when, realistically, you should be working, and you take a little stroll out to the mailbox. Surprise, surprise, someone has sent you a handwritten letter, but it's in Spanish. So thanks to your ADHD, you have to translate it line by line right away. And just like the boy from the movie A Christmas Story, you're disappointed with the outcome. It's a letter from a Jehovah's Witness warning you about the end of the world. Now, this actually happened to me. Okay, it was addressed to my husband. We're not sure how he got our address. We're not sure how he knew our names. It said my name in the letter as well. It was pretty weird. But he sent me two more letters that month. So I wrote him back, challenging every single thing that he claimed in his correspondence. And unsurprisingly, I never heard from him again. The Jehovah's Witness are best known for going door to door. You've probably seen them in your area and more than likely they've knocked on your door. They recently spent over 1.2 billion hours, that's billion with a B, in one year proclaiming the good news of Jehovah and his kingdom. But what do they actually believe? Well, today that's what we're going over. Let's start at the beginning with Charles Taze Russell. Born to immigrant parents in Pennsylvania, Charles was the second of five children. Only two of his siblings lived into adulthood, and his mother passed when he was only nine years old. In his teens, his father made him business partner of his haberdashery store. That tidbit is obviously completely irrelevant to this story, but I will never pass up the chance to say the word haberdashery. Charles was very into his religion at a young age. He was known to write Bible verses on fences and on sidewalks. He wanted to spread the word and recruit unbelievers, focusing mostly on the inevitable hell that was waiting for them. He was big into fear-mongering at a young age, it seems. Although, at age 16, he started questioning his faith after a friend started pointing out contradictions within Christianity. In 1870, at age 18, he attended a presentation by Adventist minister Jonas Wendell. Russell later said that although he didn't entirely agree with Wendell's arguments, the presentation had inspired him with a new belief that the Bible is word of God. Russell seemed to be scared of the idea of hell in general, and he made many end-of-world predictions, all of which he got wrong. He later published these beliefs and many others in The Watchtower, which was his religious journal. In 1881, Russell founded Zion's Watchtower Tract Society. After he died, in 1916, Joseph Franklin Rutherford retained control of the Watchtower Society and its properties. Rutherford made significant organizational changes, including adopting the name Jehovah's Witness in 1931. But again, what do they actually believe? This is going to be a lot, so buckle up. Jehovah's Witness teach that the present world order, which they perceive as being under the control of Satan, will be ended by a direct intervention by Jehovah, who is God, who will use Jesus Christ to fully establish his heavenly government over earth, destroying existing human governments and non-witnesses, and creating a cleansed society of true worshipers who will live forever. They see their mission as primarily evangelical, disseminating the good news, to warn as many people as possible in the remaining time before the Armageddon. All members of the denomination are expected to take an active part in preaching. Witnesses refer to all of their beliefs collectively as, quote, the truth, end quote. Jehovah's Witnesses consider the Bible to be scientifically and historically accurate and reliable. They believe the Old Testament of the Bible contained prophecy that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and the New Testament are primarily directed to the 144,000 chosen by God for life in heaven. The Watchtower Society's New World Translation of Holy Scriptures, the main translation used by Jehovah's Witnesses renders the name of God as Jehovah, rather than referring to God as God or Lord, as found in English translations such as the most popular King James Version. They believe that Jesus was sent by God and his life started in heaven. Essentially, they believe that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. On the flip side of that, they do not believe in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, 
and Holy Spirit. And they reject the belief that Mary was ever a virgin, and they believe that she did have other children after Jesus. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Satan lives in hell or that he has been given responsibility to punish the wicked. Satan and his demons are said to have been cast down from the heaven to earth in 1914, marking the beginnings of the last days. Witnesses believe that Satan and his demons influence individuals, organizations, and nations, and that they are the cause of human suffering. At Armageddon, Satan will be bound for a thousand years and then given a brief opportunity to mislead perfect humanity before being destroyed. They do not believe that we have souls or spirits, and they do not believe that we go to heaven after we die. They believe that only 144,000 will actually go to heaven and the rest of us will just hang out here on earth. And that is not until after the Armageddon has happened. Now, this is really the part that I'm fascinated by. Per their website, God selects a limited number of faithful Christians who after their death, after the Armageddon, will be resurrected to life in heaven. But again, it's not after you die necessarily. It's after the, quote, end times. Every time I read about this, I picture Jesus blowing up the earth and just taking a bunch of ghosts with him. Before we get into what happens when you leave and way worse topics, let's go over a rapid fire list of rules that they have to follow. Basically things that they can't do. Now Jehovah's Witness cannot belong to another organization or club for the purpose of socializing with non-believers, associate with people outside of their organization when it's not necessary, attend social functions sponsored by their employers unless attendance is required, associate with co-workers after business hours in a social setting, disagree with their organization's rules or code of conduct, disagree with their organization's doctrines, Contribute to presidential campaign funds on their tax return. Join the armed forces and defend their country. Say the Pledge of Allegiance or salute the flag. They cannot vote. They can't run for leadership in their organization, meaning within Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witnesses leaders are appointed by the people who are already the leaders. They cannot run for leadership in any organization. They can't take a stand for any political issue inside their own organization. They can't take a stand on anything political or worldly outside of their organization, campaign for a political candidate, hold political office or discuss politics at all. They cannot use a gun for protection against humans. They can't become a police officer. They can't take yoga classes or practice discipline of yoga. No smoking tobacco or cigars. Can't attend Alcoholics Anonymous. Sorry if you're addicted. Oh well. Now probably the most well-known one. They cannot donate blood or receive a blood transfusion even if it is to save their own life or even if it's to save their child's life. They can't read books, magazines, publications, and literature from other religions. Can't shop or work for the Salvation Army. Play competitive sports on a school team or professionally. Can't run for class president. Become a cheerleader. Go to school prom. Go to a school dance. Can't attend class reunions. Can't be hypnotized. Can't join the Boy Scouts, the YMCA, or the Girl Scouts. Can't serve on jury duty. You're not allowed to study psychology, sociology, philosophy, and viewpoints that might shake your faith at all. God forbid you do your own research. And of course, you are absolutely not allowed to attend other Christian churches, non-denominational churches, a non-Christian church. You can't get married in another church. You can't date a non-believer. Casual dating is discouraged. Dating someone without the intent of getting married? Absolutely not. You can't have sex before a marriage, of course. Breaking an engagement separation and unscriptural divorce may result in disciplinary action. Marriage to non-believers is non-recommended. Be gay or lesbian? Nope, can't do that. Homosexuality is absolutely not acceptable, and that includes being bisexual or transgender, as if it's a choice. Can't throw rice at a wedding. For some reason, they're against that. Can't get divorced unless it's for adultery. Is your spouse beating you? Doesn't matter. You have to stay in that marriage. Can't remarry unless the ex commits fornication first. You can't toast drinks because that would be celebrating in some way. You can't buy raffle tickets, can't play bingo, and you can't gamble. Also, another very well-known aspect of the don'ts list that Jehovah's Witness have to follow, they can't celebrate anything, basically. At first, it seemed like it was Jesus's birth that they can't celebrate, um, any type of like pagan holiday or any like Hallmark holiday. Hallmark holidays meaning like Valentine's Day, but they can't celebrate birthdays. They can't celebrate any holiday at all. Labor Day, Arbor Day, Valentine's Day, Christmas, Easter, Kwanzaa, and, and anything at all. And keep in mind, that's not only them celebrating their own. They can't celebrate other people's birthdays or anything. 
One of the biggest telltale signs that an organization is a cult is how they treat you when you leave or if you attempt to leave. Jehovah's Witness falls in that category. With many cults, if you leave the congregation, you are a defector, a suppressed person, and disfellowshipped. And that's actually the term that Jehovah's Witness use. Your family members are supposed to disown you. They are not supposed to talk to you at all. And other members of the organization are supposed to cease all contact with you. Now, with most religious organizations, a lot of times your family is involved as well. As you could imagine, in preparation for doing this episode, I have interviewed a good amount of people who have been disfellowshipped, and then also five people who are still in Jehovah's Witness as well, all of which are subscribers to my YouTube channel. So if you are not subscribed to my YouTube channel, CC Suarez on YouTube, feel free to go right on over there and subscribe. A little shameless plug. But all of the ones that have been disfellowship have unfortunately experienced a traumatic experience. I don't I don't know I don't know what other word to use there. Imagine in a matter of a few words, your entire family acts like you don't exist. They don't speak to you. You have no contact with them. You can't see them. It's just awful. I could not imagine going through that. The Watchtower Society publications define apostasy as the abandonment of the worship and service of God by members of the Christian congregation, and they equate it with rebellion against God. This is one of the reasons why leaving a cult, and especially a religious cult, is so difficult. Because once you leave, you essentially lose everyone. Of course, you gain knowledge and a real life and freedom, but you lose your family. And for a lot of people, it's not worth it, and they just stay in. There are people I know that have not spoken to their children in years. There are children who have no contact at all with their parents and don't even know if they're alive. Now you might think, wow, that's pretty traumatic. That's pretty bad. But don't worry, it gets worse. Jehovah's Witness have been accused of having policies in a culture that help to conceal cases of sexual abuse within the organization. The group has been criticized for its two-witness rule for church discipline. Based on its application of the scriptures, in Deuteronomy 19.15 and Matthew 18.15-17, to which requires sexual abuse to be substantiated by secondary evidence if the accused person denies any wrongdoing. In cases where corroboration is lacking, the Watchtower Society's instruction is that, quote, the elders will leave the matter in Jehovah's hands, end quote, which clearly ha- it does not, nothing is then done. A former member of the headquarters staff, Barbara Anderson, says that the policy effectively requires that there be another witness to an action of molestation, which is an impossibility, Anderson says. The policies, quote, protect pedophiles rather than protect the children. Jehovah's Witnesses maintain that they have a strong policy to protect children, adding that the best way to protect children is by educating parents. They also state that they do not sponsor activities that separate children from their parents. The group's failure to report abuse allegations to authorities has also been heavily criticized. The Watchtower Society's policy is that the elders inform authorities when it is required by law to do so, but otherwise leave that action up to the victim and his or her family. As you can imagine, if you went against, God forbid, an elder someone who's been in the cult longer than you, or just another member of the cult, and were to press charges against them, you, of course, would be disfellowshipped, whether it be for hate speech, defamation, whatever else the higher-ups in the church want to call it. William Bowen, who was a former Jehovah's Witness elder who actually established the Silent Lambs organization to assist sexual abuse victims within the denomination, has claimed witness leaders discourage followers from reporting incidents of sexual misconduct to authorities, and other critics claim the organization is reluctant to alert authorities in order to protect its, quote, crime-free reputation. In court cases in the United Kingdom and the United States, the Watchtower Society has been found negligent in its failure to protect children from known sex offenders within the congregation. The society has settled other child abuse lawsuits, out of court, reportedly paying as much as $780,000 to one plaintiff without admitting any wrongdoing. The Australian Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse found that of 1,006 alleged perpetrators of child abuse investigated by Jehovah's Witness elders, 
since 1950 that not one was reported by the church to secular authorities, which is obviously terrifying. Those are only the ones that were actually alleged, the ones that were actually reported to the organization. If there's a thousand that were reported, imagine how many were unreported. The Royal Commission also found that the Watchtower Society Legal Department routinely provided incorrect information to elders based on an incorrect understanding of what constitutes a legal obligation to report crimes in Australia. In 2021, Jehovah's Witnesses in Australia agreed to join the nation's redress scheme for sexual assault survivors to maintain its charity status there. If that aspect of this cult does not infuriate you, then I don't know what will. Now, if there is a chance, that someone who is a Jehovah's Witness is watching this. Please understand how valuable you are. Please understand that your feelings are valid. And finally, please understand that you are in a cult. Ask questions. Ask questions to the elders and to yourself. For instance, all of the incorrect doomsday predictions that were published in the Watchtower, all of the incorrect information that is published in the Watchtower, all of the incorrect information that is on their website. Please do your research. There's a reason why they don't want you to get a higher education. There's a reason why they don't want you to read any outside literature. There's a reason why they are controlling the information that is available to you. Please do not ignore these red flags. Thank you so much for listening to today's first ever episode of the Down a Rabbit Hole podcast with me, Cece Suarez. I appreciate you listening so very much. If you have a topic suggestion or a rabbit hole you would like me to fall down for an episode of this podcast, please do email me at downarabbitholepodcast at gmail.com. And be sure to rate and review over on Apple Podcasts as well, whether you are listening on YouTube or on Spotify or anywhere else, I would very much appreciate it. I will see you in next week's episode. This podcast is produced and written by Chelsea Suarez. Other producers include Wiggum Suarez and Tony Suarez. Artwork for this podcast by Chelsea Suarez and by Moon.png on Instagram. Special thanks to all of our YouTube channel members who were really a crucial part in making this podcast happen.